Good morning. This morning, our webinar subject is version three of the East Steward Standard. So we are going to be going over the, the key changes. Um, we'll go through what's new with the standard, um, how it can affect organizations pursuing East Steward certification, as well as some other information this morning. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today for the webinar regarding East Stewards version three. My name is Austin Matthews. I'm the EHS Assistant Program Manager with PJR. And today it looks like we have possibly a variety of clients, potential clients, consultants. Um, this webinar is really open to anyone. You can see the agenda for today's presentation here. We'll talk a little bit about PGR and what we do. Talk about some of the benefits of certification. I'll be going over the transition requirements and timelines for eStewards version three. Like I said, we'll be going over the key changes of the standard. So we'll discuss them at a high level, and then we'll go through clause by clause um, for the portions of the standard that have more changes. At the end, we will go through the general certification process and, and those types of requirements for anyone who, be, who may be new to this process or just like a refresher. And then at the end, we'll save some time for questions, or I'll do my best to save some time for questions. Um, you can type those in at any time, but we'll save those for the end. So just very briefly, PJR as a registrar, offer certifications around the world. This list is not all inclusive, but certainly gives you an idea of where we offer certifications at this time to a variety of standards, including eStewards. So here are some of the other standards that we offer certifications to. Some of the benefits of getting certified, specifically to eStewards as well as some of the other related standards may include help, uh, assistance in meeting the legal requirements, improving the organization's environmental, health, safety, performance in a variety of areas since eStewards covers a, a variety of topics, but predominantly environmental and um, obviously, some occupational health and safety, some data security, um, some stewardship topics, and we'll we'll get into that. Um, but certainly, in implementing and maintaining the standard or, or a certified certified management system, you're going to get help in meeting those requirements as you meet the requirements of the standard themselves. Management commitment and employee engagement are also benefits and re requirements of the standard. A lot of times certain certifications, being able to advertise certain standards may provide a competitive advantage or improve the public image. Certainly achieving objectives um, can be, uh, provide a competitive advantage or um, be helpful for stakeholder, meeting stakeholder requirements. It allows for integration with other business management systems, may have a positive impact on supplier performance. There are even sometimes financial benefits, sometimes in part due to the advertising or the competitive advantage itself, um, but obviously there may be other examples associated with certification. So 
In general, eStewards uh, version uh, three, a lot of the revisions, not all obviously, but the, the reason for the revision in the first place was to align itself with the 14001 2015 revision. So in these slides, you will see that I've left a lot of the information about the ISO 14001 2015 revision. We're not necessarily going to spend time on that today. We have other previously recorded webinars on that subject that you can view, but in terms of uh, making it easier for you or, or providing some more background information, if you're not already familiar with the changes associated with ISO 14001 2015, I left those slides in here. The slides for today's presentation will be made available on the PGR website after the presentation. So as I said, we won't spend time on the ISO 14001 changes, but I left them in the slides um, in case anyone is looking for some additional background information. Some of the drivers specifically related to eSteward certification, obviously the standard contains or requires a commitment to um, preventing the irresponsible handling of hazardous wastes, electronic wastes, obviously avoiding any any illegal transactions with regards to those waste streams. The standard requires and helps you reduce any environmental, occupational health or safety, data security, or social accountability risks. So there's really a broad range of topics that the standard covers. And then again, being able to advertise the responsible management of electronics, electrical equipment or components, or those waste streams in particular. So the subject of today's presentation, version three of the East Steward Standard was published last year. The transition deadline is September 15th of this year, 2018. So that has been aligned with the ISO 14001 2015 transition. And we'll get into some more detail as to what that deadline really means, but I wanted to make sure everyone was aware of the deadline itself. So what this means for anyone who is not currently certified to e-stewards, or what this means for companies who are already certified to e-stewards and who will be looking to transition from version two to version three, is that you need to do so in advance of this September 15th deadline to allow enough time for the audit to be completed, any corrective action responses needed resolved if your audit results in nonconformities. PJR also has to have time to complete its review process that we go through for audit packages and to be able to actually issue that certificate. Otherwise, if all of those things aren't completed, there would be a lapse in certification. So PGR, if, again, if you're an existing client and you're looking to transition, you should already have received information from PJR about a transition plan detailing this information. And PJR asks that all transition audits be completed by May 1st of this year to allow enough time for all of those activities to take place in order for us to avoid a lapse in your certification. Any audits later than that, we cannot guarantee that all of those activities will be completed. So I included an example in here. Um, the timing can be a little bit confusing for people. Um, if your audit is due after May, you would need to be audited earlier um, in the year if you didn't transition last year. So that's something to keep in mind. If you haven't already scheduled that transition, you definitely want to contact your scheduler and do that. And for people who, for organizations who are not currently certified, who are looking um, into pursuing eSteward certification, be advised that this late in the transition period, we're no longer offering new certifications to version two of eStewards. So any new eStewards 
certifications would need to be issued against version three. So keep that in mind if you haven't um, created your documentation to version three and they reflect version two, but you're pursuing that initial certification, it's gonna need to be to version three. So again, I've included some information about ISO 14001, why it was revised. Obviously, East Stewards was revised in part to reflect the changes in ISO 14001. So we're gonna skip over these, but they will be available within your slides. So that's one reason why um, the standard was revised. It follows the ISO 14001 standard, adopting the changes in that standard, as well as the new ISO structure in ISO 9001-2015 and ISO 14001-2015. Version three of eStewards also incorporates any sanctioned interpretations that were published to version two, so that it's all included in one document. They also made some other improvements to the standard language or changed some requirements while they were creating this revision, but those are the key reasons. This Annex LSL structure relates to the ISO structure I was referring to earlier with 14001 and 9001. This is the new format, um, and you will see that in 14001 and thus. E Stewart's version three. These slides relate to the ISO 14001. You can review those later. Okay, so at a high level, the key changes for E Stewart's standard version three, um, they removed footnotes to be replaced within a guidance document, which at this point, as far as I know, has not been released. I'll have to check on that again um, or look for an updated timeline, but last I checked, it was not published. Future revisions of this East Steward standard, just so you're aware, they won't be using sanctioned interpretations anymore. They'll actually issue a revised version of the standard and name it accordingly. Other key changes in version three, um, there are changes to top management responsibilities, compliance evaluation schedule requirements, changes to and clarifications of import-export requirements, downstream management, emergency response plans, changes to communication requirements. Asbestos containing equipment has been added to the list of items to avoid shredding. Version three adds monitoring and measurement schedule requirements. There are some changes to requirements related to tracking nonconformities, the material balance requirements, internal auditor qualification requirements. Version three has restored some requirements that were removed in the 2015 revision of ISO 14001, such as the need to document certain procedures. And there have been changes to both appendices B and C. A couple key term changes related to eStewards version three, organization has changed. And you can read that and, and check that out in the standard. I'm not gonna read all of the definitions, but one thing to note is that it was clarified within the definition of the organization that a broker cannot be eligible for eStewards certification. Compliance obligations, that's a new term you also see in 14001, replacing legal and other requirements. 
And obviously, eStewards has some specific import export requirements. Significant change is a key change or key term, and you'll see that come up a couple times as we go through the clause by clause changes. So definitely take a look at what the standard would qualify as a significant change. As you can see here, it's supposed to result in a couple of things. Those significant changes need to um, be reported to the certification body, such as PJR, the eStewards Program Administrator. They should result in a new risk assessment. And again, we'll cover those topics again. Risk, risks and opportunities. These overlap with 14,001 changes. Life cycle is a concept that was introdu introduced in 14,001. Environmental performance. Again, these are just for background purposes. These relate to the ISO 14001 changes. We're not going to go through the specific changes for 14001, but I left them in the slides. You see the life cycle thinking again where this term is applied. OK. So again, here I've left the high level changes for 14001. But we're going to skip through these and just know that they are available for you to review on your own time in the slides. And again, if you have any questions about those ISO 14001 changes, we do have previously recorded webinars that PJR performed that are available on the website. The slides are incorporated here, but you can also watch the recording of those webinars to get some more explanation of the changes. Um, and, um, like I said, view the recording of the webinar itself. Okay, so now we're going to get into the more specific changes for version 3. I have not included every single clause of the standard. I've only included the clauses that are more significantly changed. So starting at the beginning of the standard, we have the, this concept of context, and this outlines what issues, external and internal, need to be determined and considered, with a focus on achieving intended outcomes, which is a term that is defined in the standard. And this could be positive or negative issues, present or future conditions. It's really asking you to consider quite a few different things here. The intended outcomes are identified in the forward of the standard, which is where you can find some more information about that. Understanding the needs and expectations of interested parties, again, overlaps with 14001, as many of these requirements do. But interested parties can, can include a wide range of people or groups of people, again, really asking you to take a broader perspective or take a step back looking beyond the walls of your, your company, your business. For eStewards, it's even asking you to consider the ecosystem and the impact that your activities can have. And then once you've identified the needs and expectations, you have to identify which will be included in the risk assessment. All of these things need to be considered within the scope, as well as ancillary sites. And this clause now clarifies that electronic equipment coming under e -steward, the eSteward organization's control regardless of ownership is what the standard is applying to. So um, 
for anyone familiar with R2, this is a similar concept. The e-steward organization does not have to own the equipment for it to be relevant to their management system and, and all of the controls and requirements that it outlines. That's an important concept. The environmental health and safety management system must be documented. And it's asking you again to be precautionary, reducing negative life cycle impacts to take a broader approach, a more proactive approach, be more aware of what's going on outside the organization or the impact that the products or organization uh, organization services or byproducts can have although this doesn't necessarily mean a life cycle assessment anything that can be controlled or influenced i included a an example here of the precautionary principle actually being applied um, so with respect to the concerns around shredding plastic with um, the suspected BFR exposure, even if it hasn't been scientifically proven, it's certainly a concern and being precautionary would be to prevent exposure because the, the exposure is suspected whether it's proven or not. Leadership in general, as with ISO 14001, there is more of an emphasis on accountability for, for management, um, even middle management, really that everyone should be involved and accountable for the EHSMS, for whether or not it meets the intended outcomes, um, as well as communicating the importance of the requirements of the EHSMS. Roles, responsibilities, and authorities, those need to be identified and allocated by management, by leadership. They should be documented. They should include performance evaluations or some assessment of effectiveness of those roles or the people in those roles meeting the the re responsibilities and requirements of that role workers are supposed to have opportunities to identify hazards and it also expands version 3 expands the responsibilities of the EHSMS team Risk, assess risk assessments are required to be conducted initially every three years and with any significant change. So again, we can go back and look at that term, familiarize yourself with what that means to ensure that your process identifies or recognizes when a significant change has occurred and then the risk assessment follows suit. This again includes ancillary sites, any operations under the organization's control. The revised version of the standard defines and expands the required inputs for the risk assessment process with an emphasis on adding climate change and resource sustainability considerations. Environmental and stewardship aspects this is one area where the revised standard for e-stewards replaces or, or um, returns the requirement removed in ISO 14001 for a documented procedure. So you won't see that requirement in 14001, 2015. It's a general requirement for documented information and having a process that's effective E-Stewards version 3 still wants to see that documented procedure. Compliance obligations are something that the standard requires workers to have access to as they're applicable to their jobs, their work. 
The standard also now requires a documented compliance evaluation schedule. Export, transit, and import compliance obligations now apply to shipments of PCMs. And subsequently requires that PCM shipments be prohibited whenever any country involved deems that trade illegal. Now it does note that halogenated material may be an exception. So you can check out the relevant clause in the standard for more detail on that. And these stewards are required to meet the requirements of ban amendment, the ban amendment. So that's where we go back to compliance obligations that East Stewards itself has some requirements that must be met. Objectives and targets are to be updated at least annually and include a documented action plan or schedule for each. The planning phase needs to identify acceptable and unacceptable countries to import from and any related controls to meet those compliance obligations. This ties into the last slide as well as the definition of compliance obligations. This section has been broken down. Um, these two clauses here each requ require a plan, but you'll note that this can be this requirement can be met with a plan for each, or they can be combined into one plan. So the first clause is discussing electronic equipment, and the second clause is looking at AGWs and PCMs. So again, either you can keep those plans separate or you can combine them as long as the requirements of each clause are met. So for electronic equipment, we're focusing on incoming material and HEWs and PCMs, we're focusing on outgoing material, what's being sent downstream. Planning for site closure, um, the standard is asking for up-to-date documented financial instrument information or evidence and this needs to be provided annually to e-stewards the information for closure and the financial instrument the revised standard also details what the financial surety needs to address or or a breakdown of what that needs to include making sure that all of these items have been considered and accounted for financially in the event of a facility closure. And a reminder, the requirement here, hazardous materials cannot be used as collateral or asset value for covering closure costs. Competence and awareness have been broken up into two separate clauses as in ISO 14001. Competency requires uh, evaluation of training effectiveness. This revised standard outlines specific orientation training criteria or requirements for when that training is needed. It also outlines what workers need to be aware of as relevant to their role including the consequences of not conforming to the requirements of the EHSMS. The communication clause is more detailed for both internal and external communications. 
especially for employees and any contractors or visitors who come on site. Again, a documented procedure is required for maintaining the EHSMS documentation. And that documented information needs to be controlled, including retention times and how obsolete versions are going to be removed. For operational planning and control, there's an emphasis on documentation in order to effectively implement the system. Again, we're requiring a documented procedure with version three, timely responses for any new or changing information, and along with the life cycle perspective in 14001, there's an expanded life cycle review to include alternative uses of toxic materials. Emergency preparedness and response is required to have a documented plan. And the version three of eStewards outlines specific items to be included in this plan. I put a couple examples here they may not be the only ones. Ensuring data security in the event of an emergency, something that we may not necessarily be thinking of. Accidents, fires, and explosions in and around the facility, not necessarily in our facility, but also in the nearby area and how that could affect us. And conducting regular emergency and spill response drills. Changes to the industrial hygiene requirements include controls for the prevention of migration of hazards. So are there hazards or exposures that are being transferred to break rooms or restrooms or office areas, even to the employee's home? And what controls need to be put in place to prevent that? Again, the requirement to respond quickly to new or emerging information, in this case, industrial hygiene concerns, so staying abreast of any changes in the industry. Version 3 requires continual improvement of air quality, if possible, as well as specific operational controls including releases related to filters. So these are changes from version two to version three. Noise hazards also, for noise controls, you're required to retest after impl implementation of those controls and implement additional controls if noise levels are still above the exposure limit. So this verbiage may not have been as clear in previous versions, but you do need to retest after you implement changes or controls related to you know, hearing protection or noise to make sure that the limit is now acceptable. If it's not, additional controls will be needed. It also requires annual testing if the implementation of those controls will take longer than three months. Sometimes if we're making significant changes, projects can take time and just keep in mind that annual testing requirements kick in if that's the case. As we mentioned before, asbestos containing electronic equipment is now on the list of materials that can't be shredded. Examples of these types of materials may include certain knob and tube wire insulation or certain types of old heating equipment.
Not necessarily, not necessarily clear in version two, the standard requires training also for personnel who are conducting mobile shredding and data sanitization where they may go to a client's business to conduct those activities. They also need to receive training about sanitization and destruction of customer data. Version three of eStewards requires all electronic equipment to be tested for reuse, not just HEEs and PCMs. So all electronic equipment must be tested for reuse. There are some exceptions outlined in table five, but this expands the previous requirement related to HEEs and PCMs only to all electronic equipment. Version three also removes the requirement to take back exported HEEs. And if you're not familiar with these acronyms, they can be found within the standard as well. Version three adds additional requirements for alternative uses or alternative processes, including the need to conduct and document certain types of reviews, regulatory literature reviews, life cycle reviews, downstream due diligence on the facility that would be performing the alternative use and its entire recycling chain, and also requires written approval from the East Stewards Administrator. I included a reminder in here that an operating permit does not constitute evidence of a best practice. Export and import controls and requirements are expanded in version three. And they're also reorganized by category. There's also a new section about exports to end refurbishers for repair. It's important to remember that the HEW definition includes all hazardous waste and this couldn't relate to different national laws. These vary by country. So anyone who's involved in the trade, we need to be looking as these stewards at the individual national laws. What do they define as hazardous waste? It may not be the same as what we define as hazardous waste. As before, trade of HEWs and applicable PCMs is prohibited between party members and non-party members. So as an example, OECD to OECD countries are acceptable, but an OECD to a non-OECD trade would not be acceptable, regardless of whether there's consent from a competent authority or not. That does not excuse this requirement. Trade from developed to developing countries similarly is still not allowed. There are no significant changes in this area. You're no longer required to obtain an import permit for plastics recycling, but you must obtain evidence that the country does not ban the imports of halogenated plastics. So that evidence may not be in the form of an import permit, but the evidence still needs to be available. Version three now allows the export and import of cullet if it's used to make new CRTs. So CRT glass cullet can be exported and imported if it is used to make new CRTs only. Also in version three, if new electronic equipment is under warranty and fails or is defective, Returns may be made without adhering to the requirements of Clause 8.8. .8. I've pointed out the relevant sections there. Again, that's where trade is legal. So again, the superseding requirements are the East Stewards requirements and the relevant regulations in those specific countries involved in the trade. But if 
all of those requirements are met and the trade is legal, then returns can be made under this clause. Export requirements for reuse now relate to items being sent for repair, and they've added requirements related to data security, export, and downstream accountability on that subject. Downstream accountability, this section has absorbed Appendix A from version two of the standard. There are no significant changes to this section. There is a new requirement to retain dated copies of outdated disposition charts though. So once you revise your disposition chart to reflect a new recycling chain, you are required to maintain that old copy for at least five years and date it to help your organization as well as your auditors create that trail linking old shipping records and um, filling in any questions there. There are some increased due diligence requirements for PCMs, but again, no significant changes in this section. Eight point nine point three has been restructured a bit um, to try and help clarify maybe a time order of requirements or differenti differentiating between the requirements for e stewards and non e stewards certified facilities in your downstream. It's asking you to ensure that transporters of HEWs within the recycling chain are authorized and, and have the means to adequately respond to any accidents that occur. One significant change is that electronic equipment is not to be processed by any company in the recycling chain that has lost their e-steward certification unless or until it is reinstated. So obviously you can do business with companies that are not e-steward certified. However, if a processor in your recycling chain was e-steward certified and loses their certification, version three is saying that you're not permitted to send them material until or unless it has been reinstated. So either you'll need to find a new processor or if they're, you know, if it's a, short gap and they reinstate it and you're able to make that work, the concern is that they were certified and they lost it for a very specific reason, potentially related to the way they're handling those waste streams that would cause you to be out of conformance with these stewards by association. There are specific insurance requirements or more specifically qualification requirements. Essentially, they're asking for whoever is responsible for the insurance requirements or identifying what insurance is required. They have to be familiar with the industry, the recycling and refurbishing risks and best practices to really guide you as far as the insurance requirements related to your organization to make sure you, you have adequate coverage. In the monitoring and measurement section, version three restores the requirement for a written procedure that was removed in ISO 14001 2015. Monitoring and measurement must include accidental breakage of HEEs and any associated cleanup. And it also needs to include a schedule for monitoring operations with a significant impact. Evaluation of compliance also now requires a written procedure. Again, this was removed in 14,001-2015. There's a new compliance evaluation schedule requirement.
objectives require active monitoring. Nonconformities, security breaches, nonconformity, nonconforming product, all of these similar things need to be logged. Facility inspections should go beyond operational and housekeeping controls, really to make sure that the procedures are effective and implemented. So again, taking a broader approach to this requirement. Risk assessments need to be annually submitted along with any industrial hygiene results to a medical professional at least annually. Oops, this is a little redundant, but I wanted to emphasize that that is an annual requirement. <laughs> I apologize if I'm going too quickly. There's a lot of information to cover and I know we only have a couple minutes left. Electronic equipment tracking, they're asking the mass balance to actually be calculated at least every six months instead of just having the means to calculate it and outlines that the discrepancy, the final percentage should be no more than 5%. As we discussed before, a copy of the closure plan needs to be submitted to the East Stewards Program Administrator. Internal auditor qualifications are identified. They're also, version three is also requiring that the internal audit yield identification of the system's strengths as well as opportunities for improvement. The annual audit plan or audit scheme must address or include the entire EHSMS and should include an agenda and records of auditor qualifications. Inputs and outputs are identified for management review. Maybe some new items there. Version three restores the requirement for preventive actions, which was removed in 14,001-2015 or not as clearly identified. The requirement is still there but version three of East Stewards makes it very clear. In general, there's a call for proactivity, which I mentioned before. Preventive actions, again, we already discussed that. Nonconformities, preventive and corrective actions require a written procedure. There are no significant changes to Appendix A, although some of the content was moved into the standard. I've included in here some changes to Appendix B or some reminders for Appendix B. Um, Home-based operations, again, are not eligible for certification. Um, the requirements to certify all entities owned by the same owner also extends to the owner's wife or husband or spouse. So that's the change. An ownership chart needs to be submitted to the certification body like PJR when applying to clarify the relationship between those entities. So this, um, some of the application requirements have changed and that's prior to stage one. Annual license agreements are required. Again, significant changes need to be reported to the certification body and the East Stewards Program Administrator. I'm included an email address there, and that's within five business days. And this is not a newer requirement, but it's just a reminder that a documented procedure for unannounced PV inspections is required. Appendix C relates more to certification bodies, but a couple things I wanted you to be aware of. Again, we talked about how the sanctions interpretations won't be released anymore, but the new versions of the standard, as they're revised, if you've purchased version three, you will get those um, for free. Any new versions of, um, any reiterations of version three, any changes they make in lieu of sanctioned interpretations, you will receive.
So in general, to wrap up before we get to questions, I just wanted to go over certification steps for anyone who's not already aware of what that process looks like. If you're pursuing certification for the first time, um, what you'll want to do is establish that documentation for the EHSMS itself, train to those requirements, implement the requirements outlined in the documentation, including internal audits, compliance evaluations, uh, management review or a review of the system, including the results of the internal audit. You'll want to contract with a certification body such as PJR. And you'll complete two audits, a stage one and a stage two. And any issues from stage two need to be resolved. But once those audits are complete and any issues are resolved, you could be issued a certificate at that time. To clarify the difference between stage one and two, stage one represents a documentation review of the entire EHSMS to evaluate the readiness of the organization to move on to stage two, which is an audit of the entire EHSMS, all of the processes. So really looking at the implementation of the documentation we reviewed at stage one. Has it been implemented? Are you doing what your procedures and your, your documented system say you will do? And is it effective in meeting the requirements of the standard? Any nonconformities identified at stage two do need to be resolved, as I said, prior to certificate issuance. But once that's closed out and your package is reviewed, that's when you would receive your certificate. After that initial certification, Surveillance audits take place every year, either at six or 12 month intervals, depending on the contract and your preference. And those represent partial system audits. Your stage two audit covers all of the processes, as I mentioned. Surveillance audits would cover roughly half. There are certain topics that we cover every year. And then the other processes we would split in, again, roughly half. One would be covered one year and the rest the following year. On the third year, the recertification audit takes place, which is prior to expiration of your certification. And it's very similar to a stage two in that it covers the entire EHSMS, all of the processes again, to be able to issue another certificate that's valid for three years. And that's the three year cycle that uh, we follow. Okay. So again, I apologize if I went a little quickly. I wanted to make sure we got through all of that and still had time for questions. If you haven't already, if you have any questions, please type them in. Let me see if we have any. Okay, one question is where on the website can I get the slides. Um, on PJR's website, I believe it's on the right hand side uh, toward the bottom of the screen or certainly you could use the search function. Previously recorded webinars is where you'll find a recording of the presentation. So you'd be able to watch and listen again. If you're just looking for copies of the slides in the same section on the main page, to find the related tab or using the search function, that would be under past slides. My contact information will be on the next slide. If you have any trouble locating the slides, you can also contact me. It looks like that was the only question. We have a couple minutes left. Does anyone have any other questions for me? In case anyone's typing, I'll hang on for a couple more minutes. The last slide here reflects contact information. You can contact me, Austin Matthews. Nancy Bednars is our EHS program manager. Her contact information is also here. Um, that's the main PJR number for both of us. You can ask for us. Um, if anyone is looking for a quote or is interested in pursuing initial certification, I've also included the phone number for 
the sales department at PJR. They can get you information on pricing and audits and, and get the ball rolling there. Any additional questions? Okay, well, again, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, here's my contact information again, my email. If you do think of any other questions after the presentation, thank you for joining us. I hope this was helpful. The slides and the presentation recording will be available on PGR's website fairly soon, usually within a day. Um, they're up there. Again, if you have any trouble finding it or if you think of any questions afterwards, you can contact myself or Nancy by phone or email. Good luck with your transition. Good luck with pursuing certification and let us know if we can help.